Hi everyone. I wanted to talk for a minute about the hypothesis so that you could try to um, get that together as you watch through this video or as you read through the lab manual. It says your hypothesis should focus on finding the reaction order with respect to dye and bleach. So in this case, um, we're going to go through the reaction orders that we get for dye and bleach, and you can use those as your guess for the reaction order with respect to dye and bleach. You can also consider that we are going to be um, bleaching the dye so we're going to monitor the concentration of bleach by absorbance and how we are going to find the reaction order with respect to uh, the dye based on the absorbance and we'll go through that during the video and then we're going to vary the concentration of the bleach or the amount of the bleach in the reaction mixture and that's how we're going to find the reaction order with respect to the um, bleach so i just wanted to point out that you should keep those things in mind as you watch this video and now i'd like to talk about the actual reaction that we're going to be doing so it looks like a complex reaction okay this molecule here is blue dye number one the same stuff you would find in a blue candy or blue uh, gatorade or kool-aid or whatever so this is blue dye number one and we're going to bleach it so what we're going to do is we're going to turn a blue dye into a colorless product and the way that we're going to do that is we're going to oxidize a um, conjugated system and we're going to make it not conjugated now do you need to know that no but essentially what we're doing is we're adding bleach and we're turning a, mo a molecule that was blue into a molecule that's colorless. It's an interesting thing because a lot of people think that when you add bleach to something, it makes the stain go away. But in this case, we're showing you that it's not actually going to make the blue dye going, go away. It's just going to change it from blue to colorless so that you can't see it anymore. So it's going to look like it went away visually, and in fact, you're going to stick the um, blue food coloring into the spectrum of uh, spectrophotometer, and what you're going to pull out is a clear solution. But basically, um, you're not going to have to um, actually make it go away. You're just going to make it colorless. But what we care about here is the rate of this reaction. So this is a kinetics experiment. So we can write the rate law for this experiment. The rate equals k some rate constant times the concentration of dye to some power we'll call it the m times the concentration of bleach to some power we'll call it the n so we basically have a lot of variables right we we don't know the concentration of uh, or the value of k we don't know m we don't know n we, we can figure out the concentration of dye or bleach based on the solutions that we make, but there's a lot of things we don't know here. So what we're going to do is a little bit different than what you've learned in your um, textbook, because basically there are some, I want to call them math tricks, um, that can help us to simplify this equation. And what we're going to do is we're going to define a pseudo rate constant. And for the first reaction, I'm going to call that K prime. That is the pseudo rate constant. And I'm going to define that as K times the concentration of bleach to the N power. And you might be asking yourself, how could we do a reaction where K prime, a constant, involves the concentration of something? And the reason that we can do that is we use a huge excess of bleach. If we use a huge excess of bleach in this reaction, even though the bleach, some of the bleach is of course going to get used up as the reaction proceeds, if only one one hundredth or one one thousandth of the original bleach that we added is used up during the reaction, then the concentration of bleach is within reason constant. And now this simplifies our math because it gives us an easier um, an easier equation to deal with. Specifically, if I substitute in K prime for K concentration bleach to the N, I get a new rate law, which is rate equals concentration of K, K prime times the concentration of dye to the N power. So this bleach to the N and K are in K prime. So now I get this equation. Well, now I'm going to monitor the concentration of dye by spectroscopy. And you've done spectroscopy before. So we're going to shoot uh, visible light, in this case, 630 nanometer light, uh, which is an orange color. And the blue food coloring is going to absorb that orange light. As the dye, or as, excuse me, as the bleach works its magic and turns it into the colorless product, we're going to have less and less dye in solution. So our absorbance is going to go down and down and down. And then we can make 
some graphs in order to um, determine the reaction order with respect to dye. And specifically, we're going to graph three things. We're going to graph this for a zero order reaction. We're going to graph it for a, for a um, first order reaction. And we're going to graph it for a second order reaction. And for these, we're going to use the integrated rate law. And for a zero order reaction, the um, integrated rate law is the concentration of dye at some time equals minus K prime T plus the concentration of dye initially. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to react uh, plot the absorbance because the absorbance and the concentration are directly proportional to each other. So there's no reason to change it to a concentration. And we're going to see if we get a straight line where Y equals M X plus B. And if we get a straight line or a linear regression with an R squared near one, then we'll know that it's a zero order reaction. If we graph the concentration of dye versus time as the Y values, the concentration of dye after some time as Y values versus time as X values. If we get a straight line, it's zero order. For a first order, the integrated rate law is the LN of the concentration of dye at some time equals minus K prime T plus the LN of the concentration of dye initially at time zero. Again, Y equals m x plus b if we graph the ln of the concentration of dye at some time or just the absorbance versus time on the x-axis and we get a straight line then we know it's a first order reaction finally we're going to check to see if it's a second order reaction which is one over the concentration of dye at some time equals k t plus the one over the concentration of dye initially. And again, Y equals M X, that should be K prime, plus B, if we do, if we do one over dye at some time versus time, and we get a straight line, we'll know that the reaction is second order with respect to dye. So we're basically going to monitor the concentration of dye by absorbance over time, and we're going to make three graphs of the same data. The graph that gives us a straight line will tell us whether it's zero order, first order, or second order. Specifically, if the concentration of dye versus time gives us a straight line, it's zero order. If the LN of the concentration of dye versus time gives us a straight line, it's first order. And if one over the concentration versus time um, gives us a straight line, then it's second order. And Tim will walk us through how to do that using our data with Excel. Note that you only need to con uh, collect the data once. And also note, you can use the absorbances because the absorbance is proportional to the concentration of dye. Finally, the slope of the line, M, is going to be either negative K prime or it's going to be positive K prime if it's second order. So for zero order and first order, the slopes are negative and negative K prime is a slope. And for second order, positive K prime is a slope. So we can not only find the order of the reaction, we can also find the value of K prime or negative K prime, which we can then convert to K prime. So that is how we're gonna find the reaction order with respect to bleed, uh, with respect to dye. But this leaves us with a problem. We still need to be able to figure out the reaction order with respect to bleach. And in order to do that, we're going to have to do multiple trials. And you're gonna do four trials. Tim is going to show you how to do one trial, and we're going to present data for a second trial, but we're only going to do the calculations for two trials. You're going to have to do a third trial and a fourth trial. So in order to do this, we're going to have two trials. So we're going to have trial one, where K prime equals K concentration of bleach to the N. And we're going to use one amount of bleach. In our case, our one amount of bleach is one milliliter of bleach. So really, K prime is going to equal K times one to the N power. In trial two, we're going to use twice as much bleach. 
Specifically, we're going to use 2 milliliters of bleach. So based on the original equation, K prime equals K concentration of bleach to the N. But here we're going to use two equivalents of bleach. So K prime prime, for the trial two, is going to equal to K times 2 to the N power. Note that we can solve for k prime prime by finding the slope of the line, the one that gives us a straight line, that'll give us k prime and k prime prime for the second trial. Now what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to divide out these two trials. So we're going to take trial 2 and divide by trial 1. And the reason that we're going to do this is we have too many variables in order to solve these equations, right? We don't know k and we don't know n, so we can't solve this. But if we divide these out, we then will minimize the number of variables we have, and we can then solve the equation. So to divide the two equations, I take k prime prime equals k times 2 to the n power. And for trial 1, I put k prime equals k times 1 to the n power. Now I divide. What cancels out? Well, that cancels out. Now I've gotten rid of one of the variables. And what I get is k prime prime, which is going to be the, just the slope of the line for trial 2, over k prime, the slope of the line from trial 1, is equal to 2 over 1, which is just 2, to the all to the n power. Well, how am I going to solve for n? Here, I have to take a logarithm. If I take the log of k prime prime over k prime, it's going to equal, when I take the log, the exponent comes outside, n times the log of 2. Finally, for these two trials, n equals the log of k prime prime over k prime divided by the log of 2. Now, we're always going to compare to trial 1, and you're going to do four trials. So sometimes it'll be log 3, and sometimes it'll be log 4. Uh, four. So if you're comparing k prime to k prime 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 with three primes, it'll be log three. And if you're comparing it to the fourth one, it'll be log of four. But that'll change. But this gives us an equation which to solve for n. I can now solve for m, the reaction order with respect to dye by doing the graphs and figuring out which one's linear, and n by using the pseudo rate constants. Then I can plug in the initial concentration of dye and bleach, which is just a C1V1 equals C2V2 equation. I can find the rate, and I can solve for K. So this is basically what we're going to be doing in this reaction. And specifically, what you're going to be doing is making um, a number of solutions. Specifically, you're going to make uh, four solutions. And how they're going to differ is in the amount of NaOH and in the amount of bleach. So if you notice, the first solution is made by at, um, with 13 milliliters of NaOH, one milliliter of bleach, and one milliliter of dye. Then we're going to take data every five seconds for 180 seconds. For the second solution, we're going to use one less milliliter of NaOH and one more milliliter of bleach. The reason for this is we just want the volume to be 15 milliliters in all cases. So this is essentially what you're going to do for your four trials, progressively using one less milliliter of NaOH and one more milliliter of bleach. The volume of dye is going to be always the same. Tim will show you this in a minute, but what's really important is we don't mix these things together until we're ready to go. So essentially what we're going to do is we're going to mix our 13 milliliters of NaOH into our vial. Then we're going to add one milliliter of bleach. And then only when we're ready to run the absorbents are we going to add our milliliter of dye. Because the instant we add that, the reaction is going to start. And we want to be capturing the absorbents of the bleach as the reaction proceeds. And Tim will show you how to do that in a minute. So one thing, the final thing that I would like to go over with you is, well, we need these things because we're not going to be using um, the dye and the bleach from the bottle. So what we're going to be using is, uh, well, the bleach we are going to be using from the bottle, but the NaOH we're not. So for the NaOH, you are going to start with 
uh, 5 molar NaOH, and you are asked to make uh, 150 milliliters of 0 0.1 molar. To do that, you're going to use C1V1 equals C2V2 to dilute your bleach, or excuse me, to dilute your NaOH. Make sure that you do uh, mix it up thoroughly so that all of your solution is 0.1 molar. And I'm going to leave you to do that. For the dye, you're asked to make 100 milliliters of 8 times 10 to the minus 5 molar dye from 2 millimolar, which is 2 times 10 to the minus 3 molar. This one I'm going to do with you. So we need to figure out how to make that. We again want to use C1V1 equals C2V2. In this case, the initial concentration of the um, blue dye is 2 millimolar, which is three, two, ugh, 2 times 10 to the minus 3 molar times V1, that's what we don't know, how much of the 2 millimolar we want to use, equals the final concentration, which is 8 times 10 to the minus 5 molar, times the final volume that we want to make, which is 100 milliliters. When you do the math, you find that V1 equals 4 milliliters. So we're going to want to take 4 milliliters of the blue food coloring, which is 2 millimolar to begin with, and we're going to want to add 96 milliliters of water. We're again going to want to make sure we um, swirl it. So now that we have all of these solutions, we can mix them together and record the absorbance data use the slope of the line to find the pseudo rate constants, and then finally do the math that I showed you to find the value of N and the overall rate constant for the reaction. Hi everyone. So as Colin told you, I'm going to walk you through how to do the actual physical part of this experiment, as well as, once we're done with that, how to do some of the math in Excel. I'm not going to do everything for you so that there's some of it left for you to do, but I'll give you a good idea of everything you need to do so that you're not uh, grasping for straws when you get into lab. So the first thing we need to do is we need to open our spectrophotometer program, which uh, in our microlab system is the same thing we did last week with our food dye uh, experiment. We're going to click on spectrophotometer and click OK. However, this will change a little bit. In this case, we're not actually going to be measuring concentration. We're going to be selecting spectrophotometric kinetics, where the x-axis is time, because in this case, we want to see our graphs in uh, Excel. Now we need to select a wavelength, and we're going to clear them all, because that's the easiest way to get rid of them. And for this experiment, we're going to use the 635 nanometer wavelength, the orange light that Colin mentioned earlier in the video. We're going to click OK, and then we're going to click OK again, and we'll be brought up to our familiar spe uh, spectrophotometer screen in Microlab. So the first thing we're going to do is read a blank. Now it's important when you perform this experiment that your blank is not just water. When you read a blank, the idea is that you know exactly how much light gets scattered away from the detector based on your vessel and your solution, uh, and not based on whatever chemical is actually going to be doing the absorbance. In this experiment, we use a solution that is mostly sodium hydroxide. So we want to make sure that our blank is sodium hydroxide, because the refractive index, uh, which is how much the light gets bent, um, of sodium hydroxide is different than the refractive index of water. So if we use a water solution for our blank, we're going to get slightly inaccurate values and we don't want to do that. So we're going to use a sodium hydroxide blank in order to make sure we get an accurate blank. So I already have my uh, microlab set up with a blank of sodium hydroxide. Just like we did last week, we're going to click read blank. And we're going to wait for Microlab to adjust its LED and determine our blank value for our 635 nanometer wavelength uh, of absorbance. So, now we have that done. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be measuring our absorbance here. And we're going to be measuring at the 635 nanometer wavelength, which, as you can see, is zero. Now, what we need to do is we need to uh, prepare our solution to be done. 
There's a couple things to note before you run each of your experiments. Before you start touching the chemicals, you want to make sure that the experiment is as ready to go as possible. So, first we want to make sure our time interval is good, and if you check the graph in our, uh, or rather the table in the lab manual, it tells you that the time interval is not 5 seconds for all of the experiments. Uh, it changes, so make sure you're changing this before you start uh, messing with your exper with your chemicals. To do that, all you have to do is click change, and then it'll bring up a screen and let you type in how many seconds you want. We still want 5 because we're doing trial 1. And we're going to be ready to click start. Now, we don't want to click start yet. We want to wait to click start until our experiment is ready to go. So, I'm going to pull up a second picture-in-picture -picture camera here so that you can see what I'm doing in this experiment. Now, it's important to notice that when I do this, I'm going to do it quickly. The reason I'm going to do it quickly is because as soon as I add my bleach and my dye to the same vessel, we're going to start to get a lot of... Uh, we're going to start our reaction. As soon as we start our reaction, the bleach is going to start to disappear, and we're going to start lowering the absorbance of our system. The experiment is set up such that the absorbance will start around one for each of the trials, so it's important to make sure that you're getting as close to that value as you can, so you get the most values possible. Now I have here uh, some things set up behind my microlab. First, I have my NaOH solution. I have 13 milliliters of that because I'm doing trial one where I need 13 milliliters of that. I have one milliliter of my blue food coloring solution, my 8 times 10 to the minus 5 molar, which uh, is going to be in every trial for the experiment. We're going to use that one milliliter. And for trial one, we need one milliliter of bleach, so I have one milliliter of bleach as well. Now, I have them separated because, like I said, as soon as I mix them, it's going to start reacting. I also have my vial ready to go and emptied of my sodium hydroxide blank solution. And I'm going to add some of the things to my vial to start. I'm going to add my sodium hydroxide. And now it's not technically important which of the two you add next between the bleach and the food coloring, but personally I prefer to add the bleach because there's always one milliliter of dye to be added at the end, so we're adding the lowest amount of solution possible uh, so it pours the quickest and we can get it done. So I'm going to take my bleach, I'm going to add that to my sodium hydroxide, and now I'm ready to add my food coloring. Now it's important to notice what I'm going to do. Uh, before I do it, I'm going to talk you through it so that I don't have to speak while I do it because I have to do it quickly and accurately. So I'm going to take my food coloring, I'm going to pour it into my vial, I'm going to put the cap on my vial, I'm going to give it a couple of quick shakes, I'm going to stick it straight into my spectrophotometer, put the cap on, and click start on the screen. I'm going to have my mouse hovering over start to be ready to do that as soon as possible. You'll have the advantage when you're in lab of having a lab partner, so while you're doing this, uh, when you pour your dye in, you shake it and put it into your spectrophotometer, your lab partner can immediately click start, which is a little easier than doing it yourself. But I'm going to go ahead and give it a try. So I'm going to add my food coloring, put the cap on, shake it, put it in, and hit start. And you'll notice that my uh, spectrophotometer disappeared as soon as I hit that. Because uh, when I click out of that screen, my camera goes away. But there's nothing left to show you anyways. Now what you see is it's reading data, and then waiting 5 seconds, and it reads the data again. And it waits 5 seconds, and it reads the data again. Now this is going to go on for however long you need it to for each of your three, or each of your four trials. Um, they'll get progressively shorter because in each of the four trials you're adding progressively more bleach, and adding more bleach makes our reaction go quicker and quicker and quicker. So in this case, we're adding our one milliliter of bleach, so it's the slowest reaction, so it's going to take the longest amount of time. This reaction takes three minutes, 180 seconds, so we're going to have a data point for every five seconds for three full minutes. As you can see, we're coming up on the end of our first minute now, and it's important to do a check while this is going on. It is possible that you mess up while making your solution and you add an extra milliliter of sodium hydroxide instead of adding the bleach, which is possible. In fact, when I was looking at my uh, 
graduated cylinder of bleach before, I wasn't 100% confident that I had put bleach in there and not sodium hydroxide, so I was a little concerned how this was going to go, but luckily we can tell that it's working, because if we look at the absorbance values, they're going down. If you look at the top, it started around 1.2, then down to 1.1, and it's going down, 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 down. Now, it's important to remember our linear range for our absorbance is between about 0.1 and 1. If we're a little over 1, like we were in this case, where we were around 1.2, that's fine. If we go a little below 1, if we go down to, say, 0.9 or even 0.8, that's fine or 0.09 or 0.08, that's fine. What we don't want is we don't want a value around, you know, 1.8 or 2, where it's way above 1, and we don't want a value that's 0 0.001, where we're, you know, a hundredfold away from our 0.1 minimum. You'll actually notice that we're quickly approaching our 0.1 value now, which makes sense because our time is getting near the end. We're past the two minute mark, we're into our third minute, and our absorbance value is starting to get down near uh, 0.1. If you notice, our uh, reaction is slowing down a little bit. At the beginning we were moving by 0.1 per uh, measurement, and now we're moving by significantly less, which can kind of give you a hint towards what our reaction order is going to be in the end. Uh, it's uh, based on how quickly the reaction is proceeding as we decrease the amount of dye while the reaction is occurring. And we're getting to the end here. And when we get to our 180, as soon as we see the 180 mark show up here, we're going to click stop. So I'm going to let it keep going for our last uh, two more measurements. It's going to wait five seconds, take our point at 175. It's going to take our last pause and our measurement at 180. Now that that's happened, I'm going to click stop and our experiment is done. So, we have our first trial completed. Now, we need to use the data from this trial to perform the rest of our experiment. First, I just want to show you something uh, on our camera that can let you know that your experiment has gone exactly as expected. When we put this in here, if you remember, it was nice and blue, and when I take it out, the solution is clear. Our reaction has occurred between bleach and blue food coloring, and we now are left with a clear solution. This is why it's really important you get your uh, vial into the microlab as quickly as possible and start reading your measurements, because it turns clear. This, obviously, you can tell from our data, has an absorbance of below 0.1. Uh, if you were to wait you know, 30 seconds shaking it like crazy and trying to be really good about mixing it and then putting it in, you'd be losing a third or more of your data, and that's no good uh, because you'd end up with a clear solution and not usable data. So you want to make sure you get that in nice and quick. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to get this data from Microlab and into Excel. So to export my data from Microlab and into Excel, all I need to do is click the button that says Export Data. So I click Export Data and it's going to tell me which values it's exporting for me, and we'll get back to those in a second, but I'm going to click OK. Here I'm going to choose to save my file, and because this is my personal computer, I'm going to save this to the desktop. I recommend that when you're in class, you do not save your file to the desktop. You've probably noticed that the desktops in the labs tend to have a bunch of files saved to them, and it's both messy and hard to find the, uh, a specific file when that's the case. So I would recommend that you, instead of saving it to your desktop, you save it to your TA's folder uh, that you normally save your data in every week, because you can just then uh, put your data files in there, and you'll have them all ready for your TA. So you could save them to your Gen Chem labs, your TA's name, and save it to the correct day. But like I said, I'm going to save it to my desktop because this is my personal computer and I keep it neat enough that I can find whatever files I want. So I'm going to go ahead and name this Tim Data because my name's Tim and this is my data. And I'm going to go ahead and click Save. Now it's going to save it as this file. It might pop up and ask you what uh, program you want to use to open the file when you save it. Uh, just choose Excel so that it saves, uh, so that it opens in the right file. Now I have here a bunch of information and messy numbers and things from Excel, but we're only going to take a little bit of this information over to our actual data file. So I'm going to take my time values and my absorbance values, and those are the only ones I'm going to take with me uh, to my uh, Excel file. 
So I'm going to take everything except for the zero number. I'm going to start at 5, and I'm going to take all the way down to 180. I'm going to highlight those two columns. I'm going to copy. I'm going to go over to the data file I have all set up for this video and this experiment, and I'm going to paste it in there uh, nice and pretty so we have our time values, we have our absorbance values, and they're labeled. Now, for the rest of this, we're going to need our ln of absorbance and our 1 over absorbance values, so we're going to have Excel fill those in for us. So I'm going to do equals ln, because that's how you get Excel to do the ln, and I'm going to choose my absorbance because I want to do the ln of my absorbance. I close my parentheses, I hit enter, and now I have my ln of absorbance. If I just drag this down, Excel will go ahead, and if you look, it'll take, for each of these, it'll do the ln of the value immediately to its left. Then for a 1 over absorbance, I'm going to do the exact same thing. I'm going to do 1 divided by, and I'm going to click my absorbance value, and I'm going to, again, highlight it and drag it down so that it has all of my values filled in for me. So now we have our absorbance, our ln of absorbance, and our 1 over absorbance values filled in in Excel. You may have noticed that those values were tried to be exported by the microlab, but those numbers are not reliable. Sometimes they get messed up for some reason when you export them, uh, so you don't want to rely on those being correct. It's safer just to do your own uh, calculations in Excel because it only takes a second to do ln and 1 over anyways. So now we need to make our graphs. So to make our graphs, we're going to go up to Insert. We're going to choose the scatter plot, and we're going to do the top left corner here. Uh, we're going to choose to insert this kind of scatter plot. First, I'm going to click over here so that it's not going to choose all my data. So I'm going to insert a blank graph. Now I need to select my data, so I right-click on the graph, and I choose Select Data. When I need to add a new set of data, I click on Add, and now I need to enter in the information for it. I'm not going to bother putting in a series name because each of my graphs is only going to have one set of data, so there's no need to differentiate them uh, on a single graph. We'll differentiate them using the titles. So instead, I just need to choose my x and y values. Well, for my x values, if you'll remember uh, from when Colin was doing this before, we want to choose our time values. So I'm going to go ahead and click the little picture of a graph here and then highlight my time values. Then I'm just going to hit enter. For my y values, uh, because this is my first graph, I want to do absorbance. So I'm going to highlight my absorbance values and hit enter. Now we have our x values and our y values, and we can click OK. We'll click OK a second time, and we're back to our graph. So on my graph, I want to go ahead and I want to give it the layout with all the information on it. Again, we could just delete the series value because we don't need that. The title of this graph is absorbance versus time. My y values are absorbances, and my x values are time in seconds. Now we need to do one last thing to uh, check this graph. So the purpose of this part of the experiment is to find the reaction order with respect to dye uh, in this reaction. So to do that, we're going to see which one of our three graphs gives us a linear regression. The reason we want a linear regression, if you'll remember, is because Colin was telling you before that each of our graphs, uh, each of our three possibles, our zero order, our first order, and our second order equations, can all be written in the form of y equals mx plus b. Now, you've probably learned in your other math classes in the past that y equals mx plus b is the equation for a straight line. So if the equation that we're using is actually applicable to the die, we should get a straight line because the equation that is correct should relate to it via a straight line. So how do we check straight lines? Well, as you've done before, we're going to need to add a trend line for linear regression and check how close the R squared is to 1. So I'm going to right click our data. I'm going to click add trend line. I'm going to make sure linear is selected. Then I'm going to display the equation and the R squared on the graph. I'm going to come over here and I'm going to not move that. I'm going to move this up here and make my numbers a little bigger so that you can see them better. And you'll see that our R squared is 0.8845. Now in class we generally tell you we would like to see a R squared value that's around 0.99 or better, which of course 0.88 is not very near at all. So we're going to try our other two graphs and see which one of the three is closest to an R squared of 1. So we're going to insert another graph and we're going to choose our second set of data. So we're going to again right click, select data, add, click the little graph next to the x values, choose our time, hit enter. 
for our y values, this time we're going to choose ln of absorbance, highlight all of our values, hit enter, and click OK. We'll click OK again, and again we need to make sure that our layout is correct so that our graph looks good. I'm going to highlight my title, make that ln of absorbance versus time, label my axes as absorbance, and time in seconds. Uh, sorry, this is actually the, uh, not just absorbance, this is the ln of absorbance, because otherwise it would be the same graph as the first one. So, we have our ln of absorbance versus time. So we're going to right-click on our data, again we're going to add a trend line, make sure it's linear, choose to display our equation or our squared on the graph, and then I'm going to, again, make this, make this over here and make it a little bigger so that you can see it better on the video. So now we have an R squared of 0.9983, which is much, much better than 0.8845. So at this point, I'm leaning towards this being our uh, reaction order. But to be safe, we're going to also graph our second order uh, uh, graph, which is going to be time versus the one over absorbance. So we're going to insert a third graph. We're going to move that down here so that it's not overlapping. We're going to right click on our graph. We're going to choose to select our data, click Add, click the picture of our little graph next to the X values, choose Time, and hit Enter, click the little picture of a graph next to our Y values, choose 1 over Absorbance, highlight all our values, and hit Enter, and then we're going to click OK. Now we can see, looking at it, that this is pretty clearly not a straight line, but we still want to make sure that everything is thorough, so we're going to still do all of the things we need to with our um, graph, so we're going to label it 1 over Absorbance versus Time. We're going to label our y-axis as 1 over absorbance, and we're going to label our x-axis as time in seconds. Then the last thing we need to do is we need to right-click on our data points, click Add Trend Line, make sure it's linear, display equation in R-squared. We're going to click on this, bring it over here so that I can make it a little bit bigger. And now we can decide whether or not our reaction is zero, first, or second order with respect to dye. To do that, we need to see which one of these three graphs is uh, got the best linear regression. Well, if we look, we have two graphs that are in the 0.8 range, 0.8845 and 0.8215, and one graph that is greater than 0.99. Well, we know from our previous experiments that we consider a good linear regression to be a linear regression that's 0.99 or better, so we believe this is a good linear regression. If we feel that it's a good linear regression, that's our most linear uh, graph. It's got our R squared closest to 1, so for uh, experimentally, we have determined that the R squared, or the reaction order with respect to dye, is represented by this graph. If you remember back to what Colin explained before, the zero order uh, equation relates absorbance to time, the first order relates lin uh, the ln of absorbance to time, and the third one relates, uh, the second order relates one over absorbance to time, which we've done in order here. So since it's our second graph, the ln of absorbance versus time that's the most linear, we can determine that the uh, reaction is first order with respect to dye. Now you'll notice in our graph here that uh, our data stays pretty much on the line the whole time, but it's possible if you're a little slower in adding your uh, reaction mixture to the spectrophotometer and starting your uh, data collection uh, as quickly as possible, uh, you might end up where your values at the end are not uh, this high. You can end up with values that start to get pretty low and level off because you've essentially reacted with all the bleach, and you'll start to get a like flat line at the end of your graph here. If that happens, you need to not, you need to essentially get rid of that data, right? You know that that is not good data because you know that it's just the end of the reaction. So to do that, uh, all you would have to do is when you select your data in here, when you're doing this, uh, selecting with the X values and selecting all the times, and with the Y values selecting all the absorbances or LNs or one over absorbances, you just need to not select the values that are no good. So if these bottom uh, five values were all the same number, I would simply on my X values, I would just stop at 155, and on my Y values, uh, I'm on the second graph, but I would stop at the 155 value if all of these ended up being the same. In this case, that didn't happen because I started my uh, 
spectrophotometer reading data very quickly, so all of my data ended up on the graph, but especially in the later trials, that can be hard to do because they react much more quickly as you add the increasing amounts of bleach. So the next thing we need to do is I'm going to go over with you how to calculate our pseudo rate constants, our K primes, uh, to determine our uh, reaction order with respect to bleach and eventually solve for our rate constant for our reaction. So the last thing we need to do for this experiment is we need to find the uh, reaction order with respect to bleach and we need to find what our K value is uh, for this reaction. So in this video I'm only going to go over how to do this for the first and second trials uh, and I'm going to leave you to do the third and fourth trials on your own but it follows straight along the same way and I've even got this uh, chart here set up for all four trials in case you want to copy it. So the first thing I need from each of these uh, trials is I need the slope of the LN of absorbance graph. Now I have my trial 2 data saved here already. Uh, I did this myself with 2 milliliters of bleach and uh, 12 milliliters of NaOH and got some data and I graphed my LN of absorbance versus time. You do not need to do all three graphs for trials 2, 3, and 4. You only need to do the uh, LN of absorbance versus time since you already know that that's the uh, correct so to speak, um, graph for the reaction order with respect to the dye. So for the bleach, all we need is uh, the LN of absorbance versus time for trials 2, 3, and 4. And what we're going to need from that is our slope. So I'm going to remember that going over uh, from my equation. It's negative 0 0.0367. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to type that in. That's negative 0 0.0367. Now the slope of my first graph, my again using ln of absorbance versus time, is negative 0 0.0188. Now if you'll remember from the equations that Colin set up, the slope of the graph, m, is the same as the negative k value for that graph. So for the pseudo rate constants, the pseudo k's, what we want is we want the negative of our slope. So we're just going to take that and we're going to multiply it by negative 1 to undo the negative. And we're going to do the same thing for all four trials. Um, so I'm going to just click and drag that down. Now you'll see these are zeros because I don't have slopes for my third and fourth trials. But as soon as I put them in, it would negate them for me to give me the positive uh, pseudo k values. So now I need to do my ratios to trial one. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you remember from the equation that Colin showed you, you need to take the log of k double prime divided by k prime. Uh, for the second trial. For the third trial, you'll have to take the log of k triple prime divided by k prime. And for the fourth trial, you need to do the log of k quadruple prime divided by k prime. And those are the values that you get from your pseudo k's here. Um, so I'm going to break this down into a few different steps so that I can keep track of it more easily. Uh, so I'm going to do the uh, ratio, the k double prime over prime, uh, in its own uh, column in my table just to keep track of it a little bit better. Now when I do this, obviously doing the ratio to, of two trial one of trial one doesn't really make any sense. So what I want to do is I want to do the ratio of trial two to trial one. Now a ratio is just a division, so I'm going to do k double prime, which is my pseudo k from my second reaction, my slope from my second reaction, 0.0367. I'm going to divide that by the pseudo k, the negative of the slope, from my first reaction. And I'm going to hit enter. And we get 1.95, which we'll see how that is in a minute. Now what we need to do is we need to solve for n. Now to solve for n, again, we're only going to be able to solve for trials 2, 3, and 4. We can't solve for trial 1 with respect to itself. We need to do the rest of the math that Colin showed you, which was the log of this ratio divided by the log of 2 for trial 2, divided by the log of 3 for trial 3, and divided by the log of 4 for trial 4. So to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to type equals log, and I'm going to take this, and I'm going to divide by the log of my trial number. So that way I don't forget to change it to 2, 3, and 4 for each of my uh, trials. So I'm going to hit enter, and now I can take this and I can drag it down. So it'll calculate it for the other ones. So of course it's going to say there's an error because there's no values in here right now. Uh, but all I need to do for that is I need to uh, take the ratios of these values once they exist, which I can prepare for ahead of time by hitting F4 on my uh, 
trial one value because that's going to stay constant each time and I just want to adjust my trial two value to my trial three and four values and I can just drag that down as well. So now I realistically have a graph that, or a chart that's totally ready to solve for all my k values uh, as I go through the uh, experiments and all I need to do is enter in my slopes for trials three and four. So what n value did we get? Well we got 0.965 which is not a whole number but it's pretty close to one and specifically it's pretty close to the number one so we can say that the n value in this case is one which means that the reaction is first order with respect to bleach now we can once we have trials three and four done we can perform the calculation for n for those trials as well and we can reinforce our value by seeing if we also get about one for this value and this value now I know it's not exactly one, but that's not really a big deal. Uh, when you do your trial three and four, or even your trial two, you might get a number that's a little off of one. You might get 1.2, you might get 0.8, uh, something in that range. And you can just round to the nearest whole number, which in this case is one. The reason we round to the nearest whole number is, of course, because all of our uh, reaction orders have to be whole numbers, right? We can't have a reaction order that's 2.5. It, it doesn't make any sense mathematically. So we have a reaction order of 1 for our bleach. That's great. The last thing we need to do is we need to solve for our k values. Now our k values, if you'll remember earlier uh, in the videos, Colin told you that k prime is equal to k times the concentration of bleach to the n. So it's k prime is equal to k, the value we're about to solve for, times the concentration of bleach to the n. Now, in this case, n is 1, that's what we just determined, so we don't need to worry about that, because any number raised to the first power is itself. So essentially, k prime is equal to k times the concentration of bleach. Now here I've calculated the concentration of bleach, and if you go into the lab manual, it goes through how I did that exactly, but essentially the uh, I did the dilution equation for one milliliter of bleach at our at a certain concentration diluted to 15 total milliliters and for each of the other uh, trials I doubled tripled and quadrupled the values so if you look at my uh, equation it's just the initial bleach concentration times 2 times 3 and times 4 so now I need to solve for my K now to solve for my K what I want to do is I want to take my uh, <coughs> excuse me I want to take my pseudo K because the, uh, the equation is k prime pseudo k is equal to k times the concentration of bleach to the n. So I want to take my pseudo k and I want to divide it by my concentration of bleach, which isolates my k. Again, we don't have to worry about raising it to the n power because n is 1 and then the number raised to the first power is itself. So all I want to do is divide and I get about 0.4. Now I can uh, try to get some more sig figs uh, in here, but I got exactly 0.400. I can do the same thing for my other reactions as well, which for here I'm going to, if I go in here, uh, my concentration of bleach is going to change every time, and my pseudo-K is going to change every time, right? Because uh, for each of these reactions, I have a different pseudo-K. I have my K double prime, my K triple prime, and my, my K quadruple primes. And my bleach concentration changes for each trial as well by doubling, tripling, and quadrupling. So. All I need to do, since I don't want any of my values to stay the same, is drag down. And that'll update my pseudo k values and bleach values for everything. And you'll see for the third and fourth trials, again, there's no values because our pseudo k is zero currently. But for our second trial, we got a k of 0.39. Now, what are we expecting from our k values? What we're expecting is for all of our k values to be roughly the same, because k is the uh, rate constant for this reaction, and as the name implies, a constant should be, well, constant. It should be the same number for each trial, uh, no matter how much concentration of either uh, reactant you use, the rate constant should remain the same each time. So you'll be able to solve for your rate constant and determine if it's the same across your four trials or not. So that's about everything we have for this experiment. I know that it's a lot of math and a lot of uh, specific things you need to do, so I highly recommend that you uh, watch this video thoroughly. If you watched it once and didn't really take any notes, I'd recommend going back through and maybe re-watching some of the more difficult parts and taking some notes so that you're as prepared as possible for when you go to lab next week. Uh, so thank you for watching the video and good luck in lab.